Good morning. I'm Robert Gorell from Centenary United Methodist Church, and I'm so glad to welcome you today to our worship service. This is my last Sunday with the church. That's right, Rizzo. And so I've got some friends here that have been with me through all kinds of ministry things. Rizzo's here, and our friend Miss Birdie's here, and Scrub Puppy's here, and we're all here to say we're glad to worship with you. Thanks to everyone who's been a part of our worship services in the years that I've been here, all of you who join us on campus and those of you who join us online. And one last time, here are our announcements. You gonna help Rizzo? All right, what are they? Yeah, yeah, okay. Lake Day for the Youth today, four o'clock at Lake Latonka. August 14th, Blessing of the Backpacks. August 17th, Logo Celebration Back, the Big Shazam, and August 24th, Logo Semester Begins. Sounds great, doesn't it, Rizzo? That's right, and we hope you'll be a part of all of it. And once again, thank you for worshiping with us. Centenary Worship begins right now. Good morning. Well, if I'd known this was going to work this way, I would have been retiring every week for the last year. Like one of those places, you know, that announces they're going out of business every week. Thank you all so much for being here. What a joy and a pleasure it is to worship with you once again. And I'm not going to say for the last time. I'm just going to say that the Lord will lead us. And uh, who knows where we may cross paths once again. To all of you who are watching online, as, I, as is my tradition, I will now straighten my stole. This stole is very special to me. 37 years ago, I knelt at the altar of a church, and my fellow clergy presented me with this stole, and uh, I was ordained as a United Methodist pastor. And uh, it, was, it reached a lot further down then. I don't think it had to cover <laughs> as much territory as it does now. Uh, before that, I'd worked six years as a, as a youth director, and other positions for the church. And I just want to mention one person today in particular. Donna, would you, you don't mind standing, do you? Just wave your hand if you'd rather. This is one of my youth from my first youth group. <laughs> what a blessing it is to have friends and family gathered here today. And for me to once more have the opportunity to say to all of you at Centenary, from Prudy, my wife and I, we are so incredibly grateful to have served here and been with you and just been a part of this magnificent worship and service community. And we just pray that God will continue to bless you in the most outstanding ways. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Today is Communion Sunday, and Prudy and I ask for a privilege today, uh, the privilege of serving each of you communion. So there'll only be one station where Prudy and I will stand here, and uh, we'd like the chance once more to break bread with you and to serve each of you. So just when it comes time, the ushers will guide you, and you can line up and come through. And uh, in the United Methodist Church, communion is open to everyone who seeks Christ. You don't have to be a member of this church or this denomination. There's no age requirement. Everyone is welcome at the table of Jesus Christ. 
And that's the reason a lot of us are Methodists, just for that one thing alone, recognizing the gift that is Jesus Christ and sharing it freely. We don't take communion, we receive communion. It's a gift from Jesus to us. United Methodists believe that Christ is present here today even as we share at his table. I invite you to open your hearts now and be led in this great worship service by the powerful and present spirit of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Let's stand for the choral call to worship. Join me in the call to worship. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven. Happy are those to whom God attributes no wrong. Let all people reach out in your prayer, O God. Surrounded by your grace-filled presence and filled with your undeserved forgiveness, we sing your praise, we shout for joy. We are surrounded and filled with God's faithful love. Rejoice and shout for joy.
please be seated for the invitation to the table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not heard our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Please take a moment and greet your neighbor. to prayer and uh, Robert your good friend right over here who never likes to be highlighted made an arrangement of spirit of the living God and wonderful words of life for our call to prayer today and he's titled it prayer for illumination and he would like to give this to you
What, what some of you may not know is this guy's been with me off and on since I think I was 18. You were even younger, maybe. So, and it's really good to see each other in a, in a church. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Let us pray. Oh God, you are the great, powerful wind spirit that moves across the waters of creation, separating the waters from the firmament, the land. Your breath fills us and we become alive. On the day of Pentecost, the wind of the spirit moved among those who were gathered there and your church was born. And every man, woman, and child you give the gift of breath and of life because you are spirit and you are power. You speak a word and the stars begin to shine. You whisper quietly and broken hearts are mended and healed. Come to us today, O spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us that we who are your people might move across the planet even as your spirit does, bringing hope, encouragement, healing, and offering salvation. Today we lift up churches of every kind all over the planet. Pour out your spirit upon these faith communities. Give them strength and power, but especially make them the ones who bring the message of hope. This morning, we lift up your pastors all across the globe, and we pray that you will strengthen their spirits, that when they are weary, you will lift them up on eagles' wings. They might bring the good word of peace 
and hope. We pray for your missionaries that cover the globe. Guide them and open doors before them and provide opportunities unimaginable to mere mortals. We pray for your Christian people all over the world that we might be faithful, that we might be strong and courageous in our convictions, that we might be a people of hope who offer grace, forgiveness, and peace to the world. We pray for those who are outside of the church, whatever religion they might be, or even if they choose no religion at all, that you will watch over them and protect them and bring them peace. We pray, O oh Lord, that our witness will be lived out, not just in the words that we say, but in the way we treat the poor and the vulnerable. Let us remember that we are not strong ourselves. We live the lives we live because you have blessed us. Let us live to be a blessing to others. In the name of the Savior Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for offering, will you please join me in prayer as we give thanks. Almighty God, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the rain we received the other day. Thank you for our friends, for our family, for our youth, for our caring and generous congregation. Thank you for sending us Robert and Prudy. We are forever grateful for their leadership and lifelong friendships. And thank you for always being present and for giving us the peace of mind to know that no matter what the situation, we are never alone. In your name we pray, amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Drink in public, have you? <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> that was an honest answer, wasn't it? <laughs> it did it again. I should tape these things, don't you think? I have to do this because otherwise my wife will uh, talk to me all afternoon about it. I can remember coming here just about six and a half years ago. It was really uh, at, at the end of a, of a, a very personal time in my life, a, a spiritually intense time. Over a ministry of 43 years, you have all kinds of experiences in churches, and I've been incredibly blessed to be in church setting after church setting where, where I experience love and care and, and just a sense of fellowship with a congregation. But in that time period, you, you're going to have disappointments. You're going to have you're going to have times when things go badly. And Prudy and I had experienced that, and we were carrying the wounds of that when we came here. Uh, in fact, that before I came here, the bishop had pulled me aside and said, look, you know, you've got hit pretty hard. Why don't you come work in my staff at the headquarters? And it was a very tempting thing because I could stay home, you know, be in my hometown and, uh, and have regular working hours, you know, that kind of for the first time in so many years and have a nice salary. And it seemed like a really good idea. But God laid in my heart that I'm a church pastor. I'm called to minister in the local church. I went back to the bishop and, and told him that, and he was so gracious and kind and said, it's good to know who you're called to be in this life. And so we went to a, a, another church and preached a little bit, and then the bishop called us in. And, and it's very unusual for the bishop to call the spouse in. You know, I felt a little relieved because I thought, well, I couldn't be in too much trouble if he's doing this in front of my wife. And he called us in, and he said, well, you know, there was a plan for you to go to this place, but there's this church in southwest Oklahoma, and they're having some pretty serious financial issues, and I just really felt like maybe you could help them. Would you consider going? And as I was trying to say, well, I'm going to need a week or so to pray about that, Prudy said, yes, we'll go. <laughs> that's not an exaggeration. That's, that's absolutely word for word what happened. And I looked at my wife, and I don't know if you've ever done this with someone that you know and love really well. But, but you look at them and go, who are you? <laughs> who, who are you? What planet were you born on, you know? I needed to think about that, walking away from a, from a larger salary and, and, and opportunities to stay close to home and stuff. Priest said, yes, we'll go, because she has a, a missionary heart. And you may not know this, but, but uh, elders in the Methodist Church, like, like I am, we're home missionaries. We don't decide where we go. The bishop was kind to talk to me about some things, but ultimately the church sends us where the church needs us, just like in the book of Acts. And we came to Centenary. And after about a month, I woke up one morning, and I recognized that every morning I woke up here as your pastor, I had this emotion that was in my heart that I hadn't recognized for a little while. It's sort of been out of my life. And that emotion was hope. I still believe in hope, and this morning I'm going to talk about why. Now, when I first came here, it was very interesting. Where's, where's George? George is around. There's George. I remember our first finance committee meeting. We called it finance back then. And we sat, in, and we sat down, and what happens to pastors? Apologies to Dr. Kim, our district superintendent. <laughs> it's the district superintendent sometimes describes the church one way, and it's, and it's true. It's not untrue. But when you get there, you find out there's more truth to it. And we started looking at the financials, and there was more truth than I had been told. 
and was a lot of deep concern about the future of the church. In fact, I, I had had the misfortune, since I have a degree in statistics, had been asked by the conference in 2016 to study worship patterns and finances and things of all the churches in the conference and come up with a list of the ones that we thought were going to close, and this was on the list. Centenary was on the list. And we were in that finance committee meeting, and, and we went through the numbers, and there were a lot of minuses. <laughs> and I remember saying to, to the finance committee, now we call it generosity, which is a much better name. I remember saying, if you'll hang in there with me, I'll hang in there with you, and I believe there's hope. And that's exactly what happened. We stayed committed. We were open and transparent with the church. And not very long after that, you became debt-free through your generosity. And you became even more to missions and evangelism than ever before. I can remember having a, a, a similar meeting with the youth parents. Our youth ministry wasn't what any of us wanted it to be. And some of you explained that to me, and you were not using Sunday school language. <laughs> but you communicated very well how you felt. And we sat in a room together, the people who love young people in this church. And we talked about what we might be able to do if we worked together. And I said, I have hope that we could have the best, the biggest, and the strongest youth ministry in southwest Oklahoma among Methodist churches, and we do. Because we had committed people that gave of their hearts and their spirit and their time and their money and their sweat and their prayers. Every year, the senior pastor, this is written in the book of discipline of Methodist Church, the rules of the Methodist Church. It's a part I'd like to take out personally if they let me take anything out, but <laughs> that's not anything scary, don't worry. It's just that the senior pastor is in charge of nominations, chairs the nominations committee. And so every year we look at a list of, you know, 40 plus people that we have to recruit to lead the church. And it's a scary task. And I've been in places where you make those calls and time and time and time again, people say, no, 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 no. Till finally you're looking at each other and you don't know what to do. Every single year in this congregation, we call people. Will you be a generosity? Will you be a trustee? Will you work in missions? All those things. And about 99% of the time, the first person we call says yes. The only time people say no is like they're having an operation or they've had a death in their family. But, but anybody who possibly can, they always say yes on the first time we ask them. That tells you what this congregation is about. It's a place of hope. It's a place where people come, some are in great shape, some have smiles on their faces when they walk in. They're, they're, they're here because of some transition in their life. Maybe they have a new job. Maybe they've just moved a lot. And maybe they've just had a baby. Maybe they've just been invited by friends. And they walk in joyful and happy, and they experience more joy and happiness and hope. And then sometimes people come in, they come with someone, or they just walk in off the street, and their hearts are broken, and they're struggling with life. And after a short time, they tell me, I found hope here in this faith community. So I want to talk about that word hope, especially as the Apostle Paul uses it in the fifth chapter of Romans. And i got to tell you that when I first seriously studied Romans, I was in seminary. And I had a guy, it was my professor named Victor Paul Furnish. And he was probably the greatest scholar on Paul in the world in his lifetime. And he, he's the editor for the Interpreters of Bible Commentary, which, which is just a standard. I mean, it's, it's something that is incredible. And so I would have him in the morning. We'd be studying Romans. And then at lunchtime, I would go back to the parsonage, which was very near the university, at, near SMU. And I'd have a tuna salad sandwich every day, because I'm that kind of guy. Right? And I would watch Jimmy Swaggart on TV. And Jimmy Swaggart was teaching the same things on the book of Romans. And it was so interesting to hear these two teach about the same passage, the same scriptures, and, and interpret them so differently. 
Like I remember when you got to the ninth chapter of Romans, I'd grown up in a church where, where Jews, you know, were condemned and put down, and, and Swaggart sort of took that course. And, and I got to the ninth chapter of the book of Romans, and, and if you remember that, it says that the Jews will be saved because of the promises to their ancestors, and God's promise is irrevocable. And Dr. Furnish said, you know what that means? It means when God promises to do something, it never changes. And because of that, God's people, the Jews, are always connected to God in his heart. And, and I was very frustrated. I walked up at the end of the class and I said, wait a minute. You mean everything I've ever been taught about God is completely wrong? Because I thought God only liked a certain group of people and they got all the goodies. And he said, yes, you're completely wrong. And I could have gone back to the other interpretation, which was comfortable and felt like what I grew up with, but something in my spirit said no. Our God is a loving God, a gracious God, and a just God, a fair God, a God who makes promises that are irrevocable. Whether they're made to Jews or Christians or non-Christians or whoever they're made to, God's promises endure forever. And God made promises to the little animals. I saw somebody debate that recently. Say, God doesn't make promises to animals. And I want to say, did you ever read the story of the ark? Right? You get to the end of the ark story, and God makes a promise to every living creature and all the animals. God makes promises and keeps them. And it's important to remember that when you look at the fifth chapter of Romans. Because there's a promise there in these five, first five verses that Maddie read. That is incredible. And I need to know that it's irrevocable. That no matter what I do or how bad I am or how broken my life gets, that that promise is always going to be there. It's not based on who I am or what I do or, or how I worship or how much money I give or how much time I give to the church. It's based not on me at all, but on who Jesus is. Because Paul spends the first four chapters talking about justification by faith. That is, we're saved by what Jesus did for us on the cross. The blood of cross, the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ makes us right when we accept that gift, makes us right before God. That's an irrevocable promise. And think about that for a minute. Those of us who've been in bad places sometimes in our lives. To know that if we accept that gift bought for us on the cross, that our lives are made right and pure and holy. When you come to this table today, you come as a sinner, right? We all come as sinners. When you walk away from this table today, you're pure and holy in the eyes of God. You've been blessed by the power and blood and love of Jesus Christ. Incredible power. So Paul begins, and in, in, in the whole core of Romans is about how this gift is offered to the world. And as Methodists, we believe in free choice. We, we believe in radical, stupidly radical free choice. We believe that God offers us this gift through Jesus Christ, and you've got to decide if you're going to accept it or not. Pastor John and I can go to bed every night, put our heads down on our pillows and sleep and not worry too much about your souls because ultimately your relationship with Jesus Christ is your responsibility. We're there to help you, encourage you, affirm you, support you, but ultimately it's about do, did you, have you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? Have you developed that relationship? And so Paul is, has done all of that and now he comes up to the fifth chapter and he does this beautiful and amazing thing in which he says, he starts to talk about hope and how that hope does not disappoint us because the love of Jesus Christ is poured out in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. What an incredibly powerful and amazing testimony from St. Paul. It's especially powerful to me because he wrote it when he was kind of at the end of his career. <laughs> Pastor John's at the beginning of his. I'm kind of at the end of mine. Paul wrote it when he had finished his missionary journey. So we read about all throughout the New Testament. He, he, he had finished that. His dream was to go on and preach in Spain. That, that was his hope. He thought, I kind of wrapped up. I've cared for my churches. 
I pastored the church, and so I need to pastor. As, as I get to be an older guy, I kinda, I'd kind of like to go do this one other thing, if the Lord will let me. But we think he never made it, that he was put to death by the Romans. So he said that the end of his time as a pastoral pastor, being in churches, and, and, and he's reflecting on that. And he says, hope does not disappoint us. Now, you have to understand what the word means in, in, in Paul's world. He grew up a, a Pharisaic Jew. He was a Pharisee and a Jew. He studied with Gamel, who was the greatest Jewish teacher of that, of that time. So he, he knew the concept of hope in what we call the Old Testament, which were for him the Jewish scriptures. And the word there is tikva. And I can't say, that's my Oki, you know, pronunciation of it. So if you, ask, if you have Jewish friends, it's going to sound a lot better. But tikva, big emphasis on the last verse. It's throughout the Psalms. It's translated in your English Bibles as hope. It's throughout the Old Testament. It's translated as hope, tikva. It means more than just wishing for something. I can remember being in algebra class. My sister-in-law is a math teacher. She's here today. And I can remember being in an algebra class and having no idea how to do it and hoping the Lord would save me on the test somehow. Right? That's wishing. That's not the biblical concept of hope. The, the, the concept for Paul and his fellow faithful Jews was, was that hope was absolute trust. It was the knowledge that God's promises were irrevocable. And that when God promised to do something, you could count on it. Paul talks about suffering and having to endure because sometimes the things get really rough. But you can trust and depend on God. That's hope. For Paul and his fellow Jews. But Paul wasn't only a, a Jew. He wasn't even a Jew in the sense of like King David. He was a Hellenistic Jew. Hellenism is, is that culture, Roman Greek culture, that gets kind of smashed together that still influences who we are in the Western world today. He was a Hellenistic Jew. He, his, his letters are written in Koinonia Greek. And there's a word that appears three times. It's number 1680 in Strong's Concordance. <laughs> it appears three times here. And the word is el peace. That's what we translate as hope here. El peace. Now you know that word, but you may not realize you know that word. And when I start talking about it, you're going to go, oh, well, that's what that is. Right? So, so in the Old Testament, it's tikva. In the New Testament, it's el peace, a Greek word. And it's a very special word. And everybody in Paul's culture would have understood it. H have you ever put out a, a cornucopia at any time in your house? Okay, you know El Peace then, right? Maybe you don't, maybe you do, but you will. So there's a story in, in mythology, in the Greek and Roman mythology, about how Zeus gathers up all the spirits of the world. Good ones and bad ones, you know, the spirit of peace and the spirit of death and the spirit of disease and the spirit of war and the spirit of kindness. And he puts them all in a container and he locks down the lid. And he gives it to the first woman to protect, and her name is Pandora. Now you're getting familiar, right? Pandora's box, right? And, and she gets a little curious and she wants to see what's inside and she opens it and all these spirits go flooding out into the world. There's pestilence and death and disease and, and, and just all kinds of things that get away. And one spirit starts to leave but comes back. And her name is El Peace. And she's carrying a, a cornucopia filled with flowers. And she is the spirit of hope. And out of all the spirits in the world, she remains with human beings to help us face death and war and disease and heartbreak. She stands with us and beside us in that mythology. So now Paul uses that word that they all knew as the word for hope and places it here as a way of saying, well, you've heard this story for kids and stuff, this mythology. 
But there is a real God in Jesus Christ who is the true God of hope. Who when, when disease and war and pestilence and hunger and death are knocking at our door stands with us and even bleeds and dies for us that we might have hope. And that's why I believe in hope. Paul says that it, 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 you, you have to have a certain peace about you when you do that, that, that there's a sense of this is going to be okay, no matter what's going on. He says that it, it produces endurance, which is a, 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 another word for that. Another way that's translated is patience. I can tough this out. I can make it. I can get through this because I have hope. Hope is real. I trust in the realness of Jesus Christ to change this situation and my situation. And he says that that produces character, that process of moving from hope to endurance and peace and, 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 and facing the hard things in life, that that produces character. And character is something that, that, that for Paul is about who we are and how we live. Methodists sum it up. We have three simple rules all Methodists are supposed to live by. I will be checking your report cards before I leave. All right? Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. That's the three rules Methodists are supposed to live by. We've been living by those rules for 300 years. Right? And for Paul, that's what it means to, to have character. It means to, to have this sense of, of I belong to Jesus and I've been blessed by Jesus. That's why he says we can boast even in the midst of suffering. We can boast. We can be proud. We can be excited because we share in the glory of God. You know what the glory is? The glory was, was first talked about in that beautiful story of the Exodus. And Moses would stand present in the glory of God. It's to be in God's personal presence. You remember Moses and God would talk to each other as friends. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be that close to God, have that kind of intimacy because of what Jesus Christ has done for us and does for us every single breath of our life. Now, Paul speaks this to the church because he knows none of us are strong enough to do it by ourselves. And our calling is to stand together and do it, to be people of hope who share hope with the world. That is who we're called to be, communities of hope. 121 years ago, a very odd, strange group of people gathered together in this Oklahoma prairie where it could be 114 in the summer, mm, right? And well below zero in the winter. And said, let's build a place of hope. And they built this church. To be a place of hope. And, and, and churches, Methodist churches from all over the country and all over the world sent money here to help build this building with the concept, the idea that we will establish a place of hope here for all people where people of different races can come together, people of different backgrounds, people of different all kinds of histories can come and worship together and experience the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Do you think they succeeded? A few months ago, I was talking to Sue Wigington, Dan's wife. She'd come, a lot of you know her as Miss Sue. She, she had come to the end of her life. And we were talking about her funeral. And she said, be sure and thank the people of Centenary who loved me and stood beside me and gave me hope. I've buried dozens of people since I've been here from this church. And time and again, that's the word they share before they die or their family shares after. That they came and experienced hope in this place. Paul says hope does not disappoint. It may look like things are at their worst. It may look like you're ex experiencing the most broken time in your life. 
It may look like, well, we're losing the senior pastor. What are we going to do? Hope does not disappoint. The best is yet to come for this church. I know that and I celebrate it. And I believe in that hope. And you should too. And if my ministry has meant anything to you at all, forget about me, but walk out into this world and share hope in Jesus Christ. It's all I ever wanted for you. It's all I ever asked from you. I have a little story. It's part of my tradition that I tell whenever I'm leaving a church. I've done it now, well, almost four decades. I want to end with this. It's, it's a silly little story, but it means a lot to me. And it especially applies in this congregation, I think, in an incredible and powerful and wonderful way. I saw a thing this week, an article that came out by a big expert. and said, there's no hope left for the church. There's no hope left for the Methodist church. And I laughed. Because hope does not disappoint. There's incredible hope and joy and positive things happening. The Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, non-denominational, all of us. God still loves us, cherishes us, and works through us to change the world. You just got to get on board, stay committed, and have hope. So the, the story goes like this. There's a big city, and, and, and in the big city, there's a little store, a little shop, a little just everything kind of shop. Groceries, glue, uh, newspapers, you know, just the kind of stuff you need when you're walking home from work, going home from work, and you need to grab a couple things, an orange, a half gallon of milk, eggs, that kind of store. And, and it's been there forever, generations. And one day, a big, big black limousine pulls up in front of it. Some men in black suits with, with briefcases get out, and they go in, and they find the little shop owner, and they say to him, hey, we're building a big new expansion right here in downtown, right here in this place, and we're going to buy your store. And he says, I don't want to sell my store. He said, no, no, you don't understand. We're transforming everything here. Everything's changing. Stores like this are worthless and useless. Nobody needs them anymore. And he says, well, the old people need me. They can't go out to the supermarkets in the suburbs. They need some place to get their milk and eggs. Oh, no, no, don't worry about them. And the children need me. Some of them just love to walk to my store to get, to get candy or to get a little toy. Oh, forget about them. This is about progress. This is about how the world is changing, the culture is changing. You're obsolete. And the old man said, the store has been here. My grandfather's store, my father's store, and my store, and I'm not selling it. And he said, you don't understand. We're going to squeeze you out. You're going to be crushed by us and by progress in the way the culture has changed. I'm not selling. So they built two giant towers, one up on each side of the little old grocery store. And the day comes for the big towers to open up. And on one of them, there's a giant sign that says, grand opening. And on the other big tower, there's another giant set, sign that says, discounts galore. And then on the little store in the middle, there's another sign, hand-painted, that says, main entrance. <laughs> May it ever be so. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
Decorating our worship space today uh, on the altar and around, you might have noticed these cardinals that we have. Cardinals are a symbol of remembrance. When you see a cardinal, you're invited to remember somebody, whether it's somebody who has died or, or somebody who is no longer in your day-to-day -day life. We're also coming to the table where Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And I think that when we come to the communion table, we not only come to remember Jesus and that meal, but I'm also reminded of every other time I've shared this table and all the other places that I've shared this table. As Robert mentioned at the beginning of the service, this is Christ's table, and the invitation is open to all, not just every person sitting in this room, but every person throughout space and time who wishes to share this meal with Jesus Christ. And so when I come to this table, I'm reminded of the first time I heard Robert preach, maybe over 12 years ago, at an annual conference uh, communion service in the morning. I'm reminded of um, our ministry together and getting to share this table together. And every time I continue to come to it, I'll be reminded of our, of our ministry and grateful that we've uh, been able to share these years together. Uh, I'm grateful to, for the invitation uh, to ask me to, to preside over the table today. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When our love failed and we turned away from you, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant with us to be our sovereign God, and you spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ, whom your spirit anointed to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the captives, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus fed the hungry, healed the sick, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and he shared it with his disciples and he said, Take, eat from this all of you. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, shared it with his disciples and said, Take, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. 
Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. It is through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and deliver us from temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, broken for us. We who are many because we share of this one loaf. We are one people and one church together. And on the same night when he broke the bread, he blessed the cup and he said, Behold, this is my blood poured out for you for your forgiveness and the forgiveness of many. A new covenant I give to you. of a broken life and all that's dead inside can be reborn cause I'm i 
stop just won't let up And I know that you can give me rest So I cry out with all that I have left Let me see redemption win Let me know the struggle ends That you can mend a heart of a broken life and all that's dead inside can be reborn cause I'm warm my prayers are wearing thin yeah I'm warm even before the day my will to fight yeah I'm warm so heaven come and flood my eyes let me see redemption win let me know the struggle ends you can mend a heart that's frail and torn I want to know a song dead inside will be
For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life. have been so, so kind to me. Still you give yourself 
shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy. 
I could have the youth group come over here around Robert and Prudy. If y'all would lay hands on Robert and Prudy or upon each other. And I invite the rest of the congregation uh, from where you are to extend your hands out in prayer and blessing. And um, Allison will lead us in prayer for Robert and Prudy. Please pray with me. Eternal God, you hold the times and seasons, endings and beginnings in your hands. Bless Robert and Prudy, who now enter a time of new life. We give you thanks for their time among us. We give you thanks for our cherished memories. We commend one another into your care as we move in new directions. Give us the guidance of your Holy Spirit. May fears and uncertainties about the future be transformed into quiet confidence. Keep us one in love forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. John said, now I can do whatever I want to do. I'd like to thank my family and friends, many of you came from far away to be here today. I'd like to thank all of you who made a special effort to be here today, and all of you who should be here every week. Thank you for coming this week. <laughs> Thanks to the band. I gave them a list of my favorite songs, and they just did them all so beautifully. Thanks to the choir. Thanks to all the worship leaders I've worked with for all these six years. I, I have one other thing I, I really want to say, and that is I am so grateful that I have a ministry partner that has been with me every step of the way who has to listen to my sermons before you hear them and correct them and edit them and take out all the bits that you don't need to hear. And uh, who has never, ever said no in anything I've asked her to do in serving the church. I give honor and thanksgiving to my wife. Sorry, you know, I, I, I'm retiring. I've got, I've got to get a lot of sermons in right now, so I'm just going to go hit into the next one now. <laughs> Smart kid. Love this staff. Love Pastor John. Support them with everything you have because they are incredible, incredible. We don't pay any of them what they're worth. They do the work because they love it and because they're called to it. With your prayers and your support, they'll go on and the results will be magnificent. 35 years ago, I was sitting in a room with one chair, no TV, no furniture, because I'd just gone through a divorce, even lost my dog. 
And I was a young pastor, and in those days, for pastors, when they went through divorce, there wasn't a lot of grace being offered. It was a very difficult thing, a difficult time. And the phone rang, and I went over to the phone, and it was the bishop. And I assumed that he was calling to tell me that I was no longer a United Methodist pastor. Instead, our bishop, you hear a lot about bishops today, remember this. Our bishop said to me, Robert, if you will believe in hope, you can rebuild your life and rebuild your ministry. And if you will believe in hope, I will walk that path with you. Three years later, he called me into his office, about three and a half years later, he called me into his office and he asked me to go take another church. I'd been serving, stayed in the church I was in when I went through my divorce. They loved and nurtured me. But then he said, it's time to move to the next church. I understand you've been dating a lady and it would not be good for you to go down there and just have women showing up randomly at the parsonage. <laughs> so I'm wondering, I think you should marry her. Same bishop. And I went, really? He goes, yes, and she's on the phone if you'd like to ask her. <laughs> and with, with the bishop and the district superintendent and my senior pastor there, it would have been so incredibly embarrassing if she had said no. <laughs> but she said yes, and Prudy and our girls left Oklahoma City to go be out to, uh, for us to go and live at a little small town and serve a little tiny church, and we began doing ministry together. And I just... I'm so grateful to the church for giving me a second chance, walking that walk with me and providing me with hope. And I just want to say to you today, the same thing can happen for you, no matter what situation you're in. If you trust and believe in hope, as Paul writes, it will never disappoint. And so I invite you to come today to be baptized in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We invite you to come today and Join the church that you might serve out your faith life here. We invite you to come with whatever need you might have that we might unite and pray for you. Will you come as we stand and sing?
invite you to be seated for just a moment. Tana, come up here. You're the center of attention at the moment. This is my friend, Tana Vu, and she is coming today to join our church by transfer. And we are so honored to have her. She has visited here before because she has friends here. And uh, she has now moved to Lawton. So we are so delighted to have her as a part of our congregation. If you'll turn and face me for just a moment. Tana, you've said some vows like this at one point in your life again, but uh, we're going to do it one more time to kind of renew that commitment. Will you serve your Savior, Jesus Christ, with all of your heart and soul? And will you do your best to serve him in this congregation with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? God bless. Now, we have a part that we do as well. Let's join together. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you again in love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in the congregation of the United Methodist Church. We bring our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of our church and our presence, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite you all to lay hands on Tana, and we're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to be present and guiding in her life. Lord God, we lift up the Holy Spirit, we lift up the power of the Holy Spirit, and we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Tana's life. Strengthen the commitment that she has made today. Surround her with loving friends in this congregation that she might live out her faith in a way that is powerful and filled with hope. We are so grateful for her and that you brought her to us. In the name of the Christ, amen. If you all just follow Prudy, yeah, as you want. At some time in the near future, you'll receive a new senior pastor. And I, uh, I really want to ask you, bond with that person, whoever that man or woman might be, Give them the commitment and the love that you've given to Prudy and to me. Love them with all of your heart. Be partners with them in ministry. When there are crises in your life, when it's time for a wedding or a funeral or a hospital visit, call them and call Pastor John and let them care for you because they need you as much as you need them. Now I leave my time as your pastor but I will always be your friend. Will you stand and join me in the sending forth? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Care for everyone, especially those with great need. Amen. Amen.